When we arrived in Mongolia, within the context of our eco-volunteer world tour in search of endangered species, we naturally think of the Gobi bear, who is one of the most endangered species, but also one of the most mysterious. After many long administrative procedures, we succeeded in following the expedition of the Gobi Bear project. But before taking the direction of the Gobi Desert, we want to know if the inhabitants of the capital know this amazing animal. I don't know very well Gobi Bear, but my parents and grandparents told me that this bear was living in the Gobi Desert and that it was in danger of extinction. I would like to go in the Gobi Desert to see this bear and to know how much are left. Masala is endangered animal. I haven't seen it in real life. I want to know about it more. I heard this is really now very few Gobi bear left in Mongolia in Gobi Desert, but I don't know how many exactly is that is. In my opinion, leave them as wild as they were and leave the area as natural to us. Honestly, we need to help them with food and with water or any some issues. I think it should work the minister in this sector and protect uh, maybe some government programs. I am not sure about that, how they work. But she must, must work on this question. So you travel in the desert, but you don't, you didn't hear about uh, this no, animal. No, nothing. It's uh, rare horses and even wild donkeys and kind of deer and uh, little animals too, but not not bears. In Mongolia, the Gobi bear is in danger, and I encourage the younger generations to care about it. This animal needs to be protected in order to be safe. The Gobi bear that only lives in the Gobi Desert is one of the rarest animals on the red list of endangered species. It is vegetarian, it is much smaller than the brown bear, it has long hair and big claws. When I get older, I would like to work for the protection of this bear. The important thing is that it's not just uh, a brown bear, but it's a, a subspecies of brown bear, which makes it even also very valuable, because from the perspective of uh, endangered animals and biodiversity, this is a subspecies that really deserves uh, very, uh, you know, higher interest uh, towards this animal. After two days driving on roads and tracks, 
we get to Ekingol, the last village before entering the protected area of the Great Gobi A. This morning, the wind is very strong and a veil of mist hides the horizon. But the team and the hikers are ready to go through one of the toughest deserts. Cut off from the world, we will cover about 1,000 kilometers and try to approach the master, the Gobi Bear. Gobi bears are uniquely adapted to this sort of really harsh environment. No other bear could probably live in, no other species of bears or subspecies could probably live in the same kind of environment. It's very dry, um, the bears require lots of, of uh, habitat in order to even find food. This is the uh, wild rhubarb, uh, rheum, which is a favorite food of, of these uh, ve mostly vegetarian bears. Uh, they dig the roots, and you can see this is only part way down. Probably the, the bottom of the root is maybe three, three um, times as deep. Water is really important in this desert uh, environment. Uh, the bears need water. Sometimes they travel from one place to the other, but it's 70 kilometers one way to get water, so they have to go without water for that far. And on the, to go the other direction, it's 100 kilometers. So water is critical for the, for the bears. Gobi bears are solitary except for family groups and during the breeding season. Sometimes they come together at uh, feeding stations. I've worked on brown bears on the very far north part of Alaska and that's where they get not very much food, the season is short, and the bears are the smallest of the that are present in Alaska. And those bears weigh about uh, an adult female uh, in the spring weighs about a hundred kilos and here an adult female in the spring weighs between 50 and 60 kilos and they're the same size bear uh, the difference is they're very very skinny they don't have as much fat they don't you know it's uh, and that's a product of their environment and the fact that they don't have as much food. Nature Conservation uh, Fund, Great Gobi National Park, and Ministry of Environment and Green Development cooperated and set up 20 new feeding stations from last year. We are now in the Gobi Desert for the Gobi Bear Research at Great Gobi National Park. We put additional food twice a year in spring and in the fall. In spring, especially in April, because there is no vegetation yet for the bear. It appears in May or June. And in the fall, because Gobi Bear needs fat for hibernation. We set up that feeder station last July and we are very happy because there, there is bears, gobi bears come here. That, uh, so as you can see there is cats, it's a brew of gobi bears come, come here and one is a fruit, scats, one is a, that additional food scats.
it was in 2008 our project people is traveling around the places um, the somebody said is they sleeping in Obi Biro and I tried to see because it's my dream I really want to see this one and I stop it and walk it I try to close the that, that animal because I don't know this is Gobi Beer or some animal and I took it in video and put it in zoom I saw this really Gobi Beer this is first time I saw and I tried to close and close but uh, Harry Arnold uh, told me it's, it's dangerous and and I go back in, in the city in the car we try to close and after then is uh, Gobi Bears get up and comes closer to car and very slowly walk it and then is uh, wind is changed and Gobi Bears saw in car is like wow and after then is uh, run is away after then I think is very far is run away I try to catch in videos and Gobi Bears run away and after that, I really want to see the Gobi bear again and more. In the desert, the only traces of the man outside the feeding points or shelters built by the rangers, where there are still some remains of dry wood from the last expedition in spring that will allow us to light the fire to cook. The bear gives us something to talk about, an anecdote followed another. At the sight of the mountains around us, it is difficult to imagine that a bear can survive in this hostile environment. And yet, it is there, somewhere. We are on its territory. When we started the project, we didn't really know how many Gobi bears were left. And the Mongolian people didn't really know either. They had kind of a vague idea, but no scientific way to to determine it. So we're using genetics of from the hair, individual hair, just like humans. We were able to tell in 2009, a Mongolian uh, biologist, uh, Adbayar Tumendemurel, uh, worked it out. Uh, and in statistical terms, it was between 21, 20, I'm sorry, 22 and 31 bears at that time but that's a range it's more like uh, about 40 probably why is it in danger well it's endangered because overgrazing grazing by herders on the edge of the great gobi that they got in the smaller and smaller area so at in 1970 they probably ranged over about 30,000 square kilometers and now only 15,000 square kilometers. Their habitats or the vegetation on which they depended was getting rare. And especially in the last uh, two, three hundred years, uh, the desertification was uh, apparently more intensive. So as the area where uh, the vegetation on which the animal depended on uh, was getting rear, the number of animals started going down. We can put that post. Mm -hmm. Нету. Не идёт. А не идёт. Так что энергия. Тихо. Кусачок. Скажу. Скажу. Да, это 
Today we arrived in Chaganburgas offices and we set up the weather station. Uh, it's gonna take measure uh, air temperature, uh, wind speed, and it also has a barometer and used for uh, gobby bear habitat mapping. Why do you catch gobi bear? Well, we catch them because um, we can't we can't see them uh, and find out what they need. What is the habitat is most critical for them, and where they live and how they interact with each other. And we do that by putting collars on them. And these collars uh, are small and they're light, and they work for one or two years, depending on how the uh, computer programming uh, is into them. And so we can find uh, uh, dens, for instance, find out what's important for their, their denning. And it's, uh, it's not very traumatic for them. You know, we handle the bears, but uh, it's just like a person who would put to sleep a little bit for an operation. You know, they, they uh, stay asleep for uh, between 45 minutes and hour and a half, maybe, something like that. And then when they wake up, um, they wake, if they wake up just naturally and they're not disturbed by us, and we move quite a ways away, then they, um, they just wake up gradually and kind of look around and see their surroundings and and get up and just carry on with their lives. So, um, and the collars are designed to fall off after a certain period of time. We can program that too. Um, they can be programmed to fall off uh, so the bear doesn't carry it for the rest of their lives. So yesterday, why did we try to find the collar in the mountain? Well, we can, re the collars are very expensive and uh, they can be reused and so I wanted to get the collars th this fall um, so that we could refurbish it so make we reuse it uh, next spring and uh, we could put it on another Gobi Bear because the, um, we don't have a lot of funding and it costs uh, one collar costs about three thousand dollars plus another uh, probably a thousand in getting the information back. Why is it important to save Gobi Bears? It goes, the Gobi Bear could be uh, viewed as an umbrella species because if you protect the Gobi Bears and the Gobi Bear habitat, then you protect uh, other species you help protect other species that are in the Great Gobi. Wild camels, wild ass, Asian wild asses, uh, Argali, Ibex, wolves, uh, Asian lynx, uh, even birds, and uh, many species. You know, the biodiversity of animals in this world is, uh, you know, great value that we have inherited from our previous generations and uh, the objective of our generation is to keep it and uh, pass it on to the next generation. Just ecological protection and preservation is not only about clean air and clean water, it's not only about us, but it's about the whole diversity and rich diversity of living beings on this planet. And Besides these reasons, if there was no hope, then also spending certain resources and trying to preserve it would have been senseless. But the good thing about this animal, about this mammal, is that you can preserve it. And uh, it, you know, the objective of uh, preventing extinction of this animal is achievable. And that makes it even more uh, you know, uh, sensible to 
really to give a try to protect this animal. According to some uh, research, it's the very first, one of the very first brown bears, maybe the, the brown bear from which all other brown bears came. And so this makes it even more important because we have to have that portion that provides a wide variety of, of uh, habitat and approaches to, uh, to living. And so if we can save the Gobi bear here, uh, it will also affect how we uh, are able to save brown bears in many other parts of the world. The wild world is worth saving. Um, we can't live just on the street. The mission comes to an end and we enjoy for the last time the modest comfort of the shelter. This is also an opportunity to check the vehicles and to carry out some repairs. In breaking camp, we still hope to see the bear, perhaps in the next races, but the chances are slim. We begin to understand that the rangers are working to save an almost invisible species, but their determination remains intact. The setting up of the photo traps and especially the checking of the pictures are always great moments of happiness. Indeed, these pictures reveal an incredible biodiversity which includes this pair, so discreet and unknown to the general public. Will we have one day the confirmation that it is the first brown bear? The future will tell, but in the meantime, the Gobi bear cannot leave us indifferent. I had very good relations, working relationships with the government, with uh, UNDP, with the people in the park, and one of our rules is to work uh, very closely with the local people and the national people, and to make to to help Mongolians um, do th the work themselves and help to train and uh, uh, just be a, a help so that they are going to be here for the long haul for the, the long time and I'm just here for a short time even 10 years is a short time because the bears are going to need uh, more help than just what can take place in 10 years. We know they have, they have really severe water needs and the Ministry of Mongolia and the Ministry of, of Environment and Green Development in Mongolia has helped support um, improving the present springs that are there. But the real goal is to bring bears back to the area that they were in 1970. That's 40 years ago. And we don't have 40 more years to do it. We have to do it, uh, have to find ways to bring back the bears into the places where they once were. And that will be enough, I think, to help them survive for our grandchildren.